facing the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm going to get started here. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Michael. I'll back away from this mic a little bit. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the events director at Books for Magic, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, but it's the we're the independent bookstore located just down the road at 225 Smith Street. If you haven't checked us out, we hope that you will. Um, we're really excited to host this event. Um, before we get started, I wanted to get a few housekeeping notes out of the way. Um, first, I want to thank St. Anne's for allowing us to use their space for this event. Um, for all of you out in the audience, I'm sure all of you are already doing this already, but we'd love if you can keep your masks on and covering both your nose and mouth throughout the entire duration of this event. Um, at the end of the talk tonight, we're going to be doing an audience Q&A, um, and for that, we're going to ask people to line up um, at this microphone. You can just line up starting here and then back into the aisle. Um, when it comes time, you can just um, get out of your seat and then line up here. Um, if you need to use a restroom, um, they are through this hallway back here from when you um, checked in and then at the far end of that room. Um, I know many of you picked up a book when you purchased a ticket, but we have additional signed copies of Jamie and Kristen's books available for purchase at the check-in desk as well. Um, if you're joining us on YouTube, I don't think you can see me if you're on YouTube, sorry. Um, but thank you all so much for watching. Uh, if you haven't already ordered a copy of I Came All This Way to Meet You, there's a link in the YouTube description, and we sincerely hope that you'll check that link out. Um, so tonight, uh, we have the privilege of hosting Jamie Attenberg and Kristen Arnett, who are here to celebrate the release of Jamie's new book, I Came All This Way to Meet You. Um, this, this new book, Jamie's first of nonfiction, is as affecting as it is unabashedly truthful about the depths of a creative life um, from the temp jobs and the many locales uh, and all of the highs and lows in between. Endlessly compelling, Jamie writes about ambition and injustice with prose as sharp and unshrinking as the best. And we're far from the only ones who are thrilled to welcome I Came All This Way to Meet You into the world. It's a most anticipated from Vogue, and Book Riot, Lit Hub, The Guardian, USA Today, and many, many more. Um, and early reviews point to Jamie's wit, empathy, and uncompromising honesty as some of the multitude of reasons this should top your reading list. Jamie Attenberg, as many of you know, is the best-selling author of All This Could Be Yours, The Middlesteens, and St. Maisie, among others. She's been a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the St. Francis College Literary Prize. Her sixth book, All Grown Up, was a national bestseller, appearing on numerous year-end lists as well. Um, as I mentioned, Kristen Arnett will join Jamie in conversation tonight. Kristen is the queer author of last year's With Teeth and the New York Times bestselling debut novel, Mostly Dead Things, which was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award in Fiction. Um, Kristen was awarded the Ninth Letter Literary Award in Fiction and was a Spring 2020 Cheering Fellow at Black Mountain Institute. Her next collection of short stories is forthcoming from Riverhead Books. All right, so without further delay, um, please give a very, very warm welcome to Jamie as she opens us up with her reading. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Holy moly, it's so nice to see everybody. <laughs> My face is moist. <laughs> um, hi, people in the chat. Hi. Um, hi, Mom. I know my mom's on the chat. So I'm give a shout out to my mom. Um, I'm just going to read from the introduction really quickly. I was like, this is already signed, and it's because I wrote it to you. That's really nice. Uh, okay. Um, for a long time, I worked day jobs that were different from the one I have now. For 20 years, I hustled. I ran a cash register at a pharmacy. I counted pills. I sold lottery tickets. I squatted on the ground and counted box of enemas during monthly inventory. I shelved books in the college library. I waitressed. I wiped countertops. I took out the trash when my shift was over and married the ketchup bottles to cleaning off the dried red crust from the tops, which led to a loathing of ketchup, the scent of it, the taste, the texture for the rest of my life. I flirted for tips. I did shots with strangers. I counted out my money at the end of the night. I worked in a pool hall. I worked in a beach bar. I worked the door at warehouse parties. I checked lists. I did drugs in the bathroom. I sent people on their way. I temped, I filed, I answered phones, I typed up letters, and then I faxed them across town. I pointed people in the right direction, down the hall, one flight up. You just missed him. 
I worked in 50 different offices all these lives. I took food from the conference room without asking, and I replaced women on maternity leave, never men. I lent a hand when they were short-staffed. There was a big mailing, me alone in an empty room, stuffing envelopes, fingers stung with paper cuts at the end of each day. I worked tough to perm and was supposed to feel grateful. If you played your cards right, kid, you never made it to perm. I worked in an assisted living facility where every day a resident named George came into my office, often introducing himself to me as if we were meeting just for, for just the first time. He carried a hoe with him which belonged to his grandfather who brought it with him from Norway decades ago. And George would use it to tend the roses in the garden outside the facility. Sometimes he would tell me the same story about the hoe too. George was sweet and he was a gentleman. I learned a lot about people and how to be in the world. I worked for a startup where my job was essentially to type really fast all day long. I talked to no one for months, I just typed. The next job, I signed people into conference rooms and assisted with their meetings and listened to them talk about their important jobs while they ignored my existence. I smiled when I didn't feel like it. I tried another job and another job and another job, always searching for a place I could call home. I was creative and I was curious and there was a propulsiveness to my life. I was completely engaged in forward motion, yet I had no specific direction. A problem I had, figuring out the direction. I spell checked, I sent emails, I did math, I copy edited. They would find out I could write and then ask me to write something and it would be a paragraph or two and it made me feel important and special and necessary and like I wasn't totally wasting my life, even if I was writing something that wasn't interesting at all. A forgettable arrangement of words, a decoration on the page, the baby's breath in corporate America found a way into working on the internet, which was then the new frontier. I wrote, I produced plenty of it garbage. I learned what code was, I learned what keywords were, I learned how to structure a website. Information architecture. I liked that idea of organizing information. I learned how to write short and snappy things. I worked for advertising agencies, lots of them. It felt like every agency in town. I watched things I wrote finally exist in the world with the recognition that no one would ever know it came from me. I was detached from the thing I was making. I had no ownership of it. On the side, I started writing personal things on the internet, blog posts, little essays here and there, and I began to tune the sound of my voice. I argued with my coworkers about things that seemed important at the time. I asked for raises and got them. I quit, I got fired. A few times I didn't get jobs because people read something I had written on the internet. I had jobs where I was taken less seriously or my opinions dismissed entirely for being a woman. I have been told I am difficult. I am difficult in the sense that I am not easy, but fuck easy. I have been harassed at work, but seriously, who hasn't? I worked for a cable network and websites for critically acclaimed television shows, all of which were created by men. It was the best job I ever had besides the one I have now. I watched how everyone ran around making these shows happen, what a massive amount of work went into their production. Such brilliant people worked on them, but all of the credit was given to the show's creators. Their creativity, their genius, they had come up with the ideas, they had ownership. The rest of us were there to make their vision come to life. We served their ideas. Eventually I thought, what about my ideas? When do I own them? And once I realized that, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I could not stay where I was any longer. The solution was to write my way out of the problem. That meant writing early in the morning, late at night, and on weekends. It meant carving out time, claiming it for myself. I thought, I will write this first book, and then maybe another after that. This is the thing I want to do. This desire informed life choices I made, paths I took, and paths I rejected. Everything got easier in a way once I realized this is what I wanted, even as things got much, much harder. I had decided to operate in service of my ideas. There are plenty of reasons why I write. This is just one of them. The sense that I want to own something, own my work, own my creativity, own my name. It is perhaps not the purest reason, not truest of heart, for there's some ego attached to it, but it is real. I own these words. I own these ideas. Here is my book. It's goddamn cold outside, cold and house. there's a lot going on. It means so, so much thank to you. you for being here. And Mr. Magic, thank you guys so much for 
organizing the space so we can all feel safe and comfortable and okay now please continue <laughs> No, I think that that's a perfect way because I was like, thank you, Books Are Magic, um, for letting me sit and talk to my dear friend about a book that feels like talking to friends. Like, it's a book that feels intimate and personal and special and close. So it feels like a very natural thing to just be sitting here and talking with you and like an extension of talking to all of you about a book that I think is warm and kind about embracing intimacy and work in this kind of way. So, um, I have like a million questions I want to ask you and I'm not going to be able to get through all of them. That's per usual. I feel like that's every time I see you, it's like I have a thousand questions and then you have to leave. But, um, I am going to try and get through some and then you all can come up and ask Jamie any of your questions that you have. But, um, this wasn't even what I was going to open with, but even listening to you read that opening, which I think is fantastic, um, that sets you up for all the different things and ideas that you talk about inside of this book, is like writing your way through the problem, <laughs> um, which is something I think about a lot, um, just as like a person who never knows what I think about anything. Yeah. Um, so I'd love if you could talk about specifically this book and like the idea of like writing through it, like writing through a problem, writing through a problem. and like what a problem can but be. But the, yeah. the problem in this book is the problem of me. Yeah. That's the biggest problem I have <laughs> <laughs> more than anything else because that's the problem, that's the thing I have to wake up with every day is the problem of It's me. the problem? Yeah, yeah, I'm the problem. Um, but I'm also the solution, right? So if I can like sort of crack myself a little, you know, a little bit every day, then I can get to, to the next place. I mean, I think this book was like, I don't think I sat down to write a book that was like, I'm gonna figure everything about myself out because I think that's actually impossible. And actually I, I personally enjoy the little mysteries of myself too, right? As much as I enjoy the little mysteries of other people. Um, but I, I had some things from my past that I wanted to figure out. And, um, and I, or just explore and like try to figure out what the lessons were that I'd learned from them or if there were any lessons to learn. Because sometimes it's like you can get a lot out of something and sometimes it just sucks, right? Or, or sometimes it's just amazing and, and something magical has happened. So I, I think that sitting down and writing about those, you know, these different stages in my life, particularly this book takes place, you know, kind of mid to late 30s until now. And I'm, I just turned 50. Um, and it's sort of like chewing on the times when I've struggled in my life. Mostly, I think it's struggling with like art, yeah, and trying to like make a living off of it, and trying trying to like make great great art or good art. I would settle for good art any day of the week. <laughs> um, that that's kind of what I'm chewing on in this book is like how I how I sort of broke through and how um, and the things that I need to be doing in order to continue to break through, and that's. It's a constant evolution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to ask you, like, too many craft questions, because that's, like, um... I'm a nerd. nerd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, into the nuts and bolts. <laughs> God damn it, Jamie. Um, but I, I am interested in it, just from, like, because this is, like, you have been working and writing and, like, making great things for a while. And this is your debut like memoir yeah and like it's like this is like a first for you and I don't know if like I I, I mean a thing that's lucky for me just as a person first of all have you as a friend um, but it's been in the middle of this process for you to be able to like hear you talk about like what ha has been like for you in this kind of nebulous kind of first do something phase. Brand new. yeah and like what what that was like and how it is different for you than you know, than the other books that you have made and other kinds of art that you have made. Like, what is that like? I mean, it was really, it was really hard and I wanted to do something that was really hard and I wanted to do something new. I don't want to say that I, I definitely have not perfected the craft of like writing fiction and nobody has, but I have written seven books of fiction yeah, in a row. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I need, I just more needed to stretch myself in a different direction, I think, more than anything else. Like I sort of felt like, I don't think I was, I, my book sounded like, but I knew that I was sort of, and it wasn't spinning either, but I just, my gut was like, I need to try something new. 
Um, but it was completely unfamiliar territory to me because I have written, I've written plenty of essays over the years, but those are like, I think there's some, uh, probably some of writers in this room, when you write an essay for a magazine or a newspaper, it's like, it's gonna be about a thousand words or maybe 1,500 words if you're lucky. And they want it to really fit into a box, right? Like they want it to have a specific kind of narrative and you make specific kinds of choices when you're writing those, you know, you have to decide what something's about, right? The aboutness of it, you know, that's what the magazine or the newspaper or whatever, website or whatever is looking for. And when I sat down to write this, I was taking some previously published material and some brand new material, but I had a, my editor, Helen, who was sitting over there, was like, go long, right? Go long and see what it's see what it's about when you don't have to fit it into that box. Right. Did you say I'm, that's right, Helen? Right? Yeah. And so I was like, I don't want to quote you. But that's really what it was. It was that one. So that was a challenge. It was like, what if you what if you could figure it out in a different way? And that felt risky to me. Like there was a certain there's a certain safety in a way to fitting it into that box. Like you know what the expectations are from you, and you know you can see what it's going to look like. You even know what the font is, right? Yeah. And I think that when you're writing a memoir or a longer piece of nonfiction, anything goes, and that's incredibly freeing and incredibly scary at the same time. And I wrote the book. I think is like seventy-two thousand words, and I wrote ninety-two thousand words, which means I cut twenty thousand words. And so that was part of the process too. It's like deciding which twenty thousand words to cut mm -hmm. and how. And so part of that was like I had this amazing editor who was able to say, "This is you know this doesn't work for this reason or that reason." But at some point, I also had to make the decision what kind of story I was presenting to the world. Sure. And that was hard also. I only I it's it's like I didn't want. I spent so much time thinking I'm not gonna, I'm going to tell the truth about myself, but ultimately I still had to choose a version of myself. Yeah. A yeah, 72,000 word version of myself, but a version of myself nonetheless, but it feels pretty close to me. Yeah. I mean, you know me, it sounds like me, right? It's, it sounds yeah. like you. Yeah, I love, I love that too, because it's like, right, like the idea of like a truth of something. Because there is like, I wrote this down in here, but I'm going to like paraphrase you, I'm very sorry. But the idea of like, um, when you feel like you know something about yourself, that's when you know you're dead wrong. Yeah. Um, and I love that, bringing that energy into writing about the self because I think that that's like the most honest thing is this idea of like here's what I'm telling you right now here's what I know in this moment what I know about myself is that I don't that I don't know yeah yeah that's like a, a constantly as you get older you're like oh I thought I knew everything and I don't know yeah when you're in your 20s you're like I know everything about the world <laughs> and you get to the 30s it feels a little weird and then the 40s there's like this new plateau where you're like no I know I know and now I'm like feeling like it's okay that I don't know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and I really don't want to like ever be finished knowing. Mm -hmm. Like I, I definitely like know myself a lot more than I used to, and I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of the person that I've become, but I also know that I'm not set. It's I'm not set in stone. None of us are, and we're, we should be like this is set in stone, right? <laughs> this is it. This is literally set in stone, <laughs> and the rest of us are all like living, changing, altering beings that have to respond to a world around us. Yeah. So I. I think it's about keeping tabs on it and, and keeping track of yourself too. I think that's why writing is so helpful. Even if you're not trying to become a professional writer, this is why I'm always an advocate for it, is because it's just it's just helpful to put your thoughts in a place and on the paper. And even if it changes, you checked in with yourself at that moment. And that's really, really powerful. It's, a, it's just like a gift you can give yourself when you check in with yourself on the page. Yeah. Honestly, that's been helpful to me to hear you say that all the time because I think it's like it's a way of kind of not checking in is when I don't do it. Yeah. So when you want to hide from yourself. Yeah. You don't want to go anywhere near that notebook. Oh my god, I don't want yeah. to see that. That's when you're on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for sweaters. <laughs> or yeah, just like basically poisoning myself, yeah. buying things. Yes. Online. Right, yeah. Um I did, like I think that this is like an interesting thing too, because when I think about fiction, it's like the idea of writing into the unknown or writing into like the mystery of something. Um, and you talking about writing a very specifically, yeah, like word count. Here's thematically what we want. Here's the box where this kind of thing fits. Um, and being given the opportunity or being told specifically to write outside of that, like the kind of mysteries you encounter are of a different variety of the self. Yeah, and like. That is exciting, but also maybe terrifying. 
Yes, mysteries of the self. Yeah, that's a really good phrase, Krista. I remember. <laughs> and if I can remember anything from like, like the last week, it's going to be that <laughs> mysteries of the self. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I learned new stuff from writing about my, I mean, I can learn stuff about myself in writing fiction, even if the characters aren't, aren't about me, but I think the nonfiction was like, especially because now it's like solidly in a book, so, and I've been doing interviews for like the last like month or something, I don't, sometimes they're like, they bring stuff up that I said, and I was like, <laughs> that's not smart, I wonder who said that, I'm not sure it was me. But it was, but it is, so in a way it's like the, even though like this is very much a words and all book, it is like, in a way, the best version of myself. It's like the best, worst version of myself. Mm -hmm. Like it's the most refined, worst version of myself. <laughs> that is, I don't know, I like that way of describing myself. Um, I mean, this is a book too that I, I, I feel very lucky that I got to read when we were still in the process of making it. Um, I got to see like an early draft of it and see like the creation and how you were touching on things and moving pieces around and 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 seeing what what kind of fit together like puzzle pieces like the kind of locking together of things um, and immediately when I read it was like it had this um, very intimate feel to it this kind of way in which it felt like literally you sitting down next to me and being like hey I want to talk to you about this and so like the the, the way that it comes across is this like close like personal conversation and is that something like you were yeah it's still very deliberate on my part I really wanted to have a conversational feel I mean most of my because again when you write for magazines and newspapers and things like that like there's a certain kind of level of refinement that they want to have that have, have it have, and there's always, if, if you've ever gone through the process of having an essay edited and all of a sudden they take out all your quirky asides, and you're like, I love that quirky aside, and they're like, nope, <laughs> we do not do that. We do not do that here at, you know, personalstory.com or whatever the heck it is. Um, which is a mistake, I love quirky asides. So anyway, I could like, you know, I was sort of free to do whatever I wanted. I still ended up kind of taking out some of the quirky asides, but like, I would, like, there was, I thought, this is it, this is my one shot. I mean, I think everything we're writing should kind of be like that feeling, though. This is my one shot. I definitely was like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> this is the only time I've ever going to tell these stories, really. So I wanted to make, I just wanted to, like, really lay it out there. And I wanted, I, for me, when I write fiction, even then it's kind of, it can be conversational some of the time. Sure, Sometimes yeah. I break the, the wall and talk to the reader directly, things like that. Mm -hmm. But for me, writing is my conversation with the world. Mm -hmm. It's the way that I talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. And there's other ways that I do it too. I mean, you know, there's a spectrum of writing, like, you know, Twitter would be on one end and like a novel would be on the other end of it. Yeah. And so it's, it's definitely the, it's just become this thing that I, I don't even want to say I lean on it like a crutch because that's not what it is. It's just it's just very fluid for me that this is how I this is how I'm talking to people. This is like mm -hmm. part of my being is like I'm put I'm gonna say I'm gonna write something down and it's gonna be the way that I connect with, with the world. And I think part of it has to do I'm not trying to put myself down here because this is my day, guys. This is your special day. My special day. I'm leaving for a day. This is my only like big event because everything has gotten canceled. Yeah. And I'm also like in a holy place. As a Jew, I recognize it's really nice. Um, there is some stuff here. Um, but anyway, I like, I do think that part of it comes from the fact that like I have like a sometimes like a low level of dread. <laughs> Like about whatever, like because I'll just talk and talk. You know what I mean? And yeah. you say like the wrong thing or you're awkward or whatever. But like with your words, you can always kind of say the right thing. Yeah. Even if it's the wrong thing, you've chosen to say those words. But yeah. when you open your mouth, that's when you can screw things up. You know. <laughs> so I, I definitely like have leaned into using my writing as like my, as like the my favorite way of communicating with the world. But also. You know, my writing has opened up so many doors for me and has allowed me to travel all over the world and have my books published in other countries and things like that. So it's like, it's truly is my conversation with the world. Yeah. You know, it feels really real to me that I can say something to people all over the place and reach all these people. Mm -hmm. And it's very special and I, and I appreciate it. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. I think you did. Okay, good. <laughs> But I think it's like, it segues nicely into like another thing I, that I think this book is quite often about is the idea of friendship and how friendship with other writers 
and having conversation, being in conversation. Like I know we're in conversation right now, but this feels like how we're in conversation with each other just in our friendship. Yeah. Like sitting down over like a couple of beers or like in your house or like a couple uh, beers for you. Yeah, a couple <laughs> beers in for me, Jamie, so we're going first. Yeah. Um but like the idea of like um writing being an ongoing conversation like between people, I feel like is like a through line that like meanders very beautifully through this book and talking with like friends that you know that are other writers and how like those conversations about writing impacted like the trajectory of your own work and how you thought about things and moving forward your own conversations with other writers. I mean it's just the idea of meeting your people. Yeah. Like it was really nice to meet my people. I think that I didn't I wasn't an undergrad I, I was a creative writing major and then I it took me a long time, it took me like until my early thirties, so like a decade to really be like I'm settling into like this is what it is and this is what I'm doing. And then I remember when I started meeting other writers, I lived in New York then. I was so sad. I was just like, all of you, I want to make friends with every last one of you. And I'm still that way because I, because there's a shorthand, I think, that writers have with each other. And I, I, and so I also recognize the shorthand and I, if you meet the right people, like we're all going to support each other and cheer for each other and give, and be helpful with our, you know, like reading other, other people's work. Like you're always so, you always find the one thing that you really love. This is what you do. I don't know if you know this or not, but you like find one thing and you're like early on in something and you will like always like look for that thing throughout the book and you'll be like, this is the thing that you should, you know, like you, it's great. It's very, very helpful because you remind me of that thing that I should be always be looking for. So, uh, you know, I, people, and I try to give really good notes and, uh, you know, it is to my great surprise, and I said this to Emma fairly recently, it is to my great surprise that I am a cheer have become a cheerleader. Because I have been so cranky for so long, <laughs> and then I got nicer, which is so weird to me. Because I was like a very cranky lady for a long time. And I still have a little crankiness in me, but I, you know, it's, I, I think I just get more out, I just get so much out of it, and I want other people to get out of it, get things out of it too, and I like that it's like, collaborative and that we're all part of the community like I just appreciate that so so much and I so I think I also identify with people who are haven't found their people yet because it took me so long yeah. it took me a really long and this book is a little bit about that too about the loneliness and and you know I was a lonely kid yeah were you a lonely kid yeah. <laughs> I think being in your own head a lot can make even even if you're not like having people around you, this idea of like having like a very deeply rich like internal kind of world and not really understanding how to get that, it. Yeah, get that out of the space of your brain, like makes sense. But yeah, I'd love to talk about like the idea of like the idea of like loneliness and solitude, which you talk about very beautifully in this book. Because I think that there's this, I, like the space of like making art, no matter what that art looks like, you know, because there's lots of different kinds of art that we ingest and take in and enjoy. And, like how the making of art is quite often. Right. It requires it, right? Yeah. Especially writing, unless you like have a writing partner or something like that. But, um, and so you have to be a, a certain kind of person who enjoys or appreciates a long time. For me, I always just really loved the characters in my head and they kept me company. And that was a natural inclination from when I was a very young age. I was just like that kid who walked down the street and like daydreaming and singing to them. My mom said that like I, like, she would see the neighbors, or the neighbors would see me, and they would call her and be like, your daughter is talking to the sky. <laughs> She's a weirdo. <laughs> and she would, she was like, yeah, I guess she's kind of a weirdo. Um, mom's in chat right now going, she was perfect. <laughs> we loved her. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I, so I still have, like, I still need, like, a lot of alone time, a lot of, like, staring out into the sky, or into space kind of time, too. Yeah. Like, I need, like, all of that, but I also need people, yeah. and, um, for various reasons, and, um, not in a bad way, and not in a using people kind of way, but just, like, in a, we're all on this planet, can we hang out kind of way. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know, I treasure loneliness, but there, I do talk about it in the book, sort of the difference between being like lonely and like 
loneliness versus solitude and things like that, and like what's, what you get, can get out of solitude. And um, that it just is, allows you, I think, the quiet that you need in order to think. You know. I mean, I see that too, like you talk about that in there, it's like the idea of like um, the amounts, right? Just kind of the balancing act of like where it sits, like maybe there there can be a way in which it's like too much of one. Yeah. Or like too good, like too, too much lonely. of something. Yeah, yeah, I've had moments where I've like when I've been really sad in my life mm-hmm. and it's because I haven't talked to anyone. I, I know that these past two years have been happy. I've been hard, I think, for people in different places in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if you live by yourself, which I do, um, where you have to like secure the people that you like that you can do check-ins with or see or you know, and, and even I guess through Zoom screens and stuff like that, but it's not quite the same as like the in-person thing. I think it's like can be when you're a fiercely independent person, which is what I am and which I've like, you know, been riding that horse for a really long time. Um, like to admit that you need people can sometimes be hard. Yeah. And so that has been probably one of the most important things about getting like growing up and like becoming a happier person is like recognizing, oh, I need people too. Mm-hmm. That's very sweet. <laughs> is it <that> sad? <laughs> um, I need friends. <laughs> I love how you brought up Joan. Um, Joan Amber. Joan Amber. Got to stay back. Yeah. Because um, I think another thing that I deeply valued about reading this was the idea that um, families all have this kind of like inset narrative, like stories that like live inside of the family and those things like the stories that, that sit inside of our households and our families inform like, especially if we're creators and like making things, like inform the way we like look at art. And so, yeah, like a traveling salesman, like the idea of like your father doing these kinds of like salesman things, and yeah. like, and then how you how you do yourself, and like even the subconscious ways. I feel happen. like I'm, so we're not talking about the book enough, but I promise you we are. If you haven't read it yet, <laughs> um, but I, th- they all are sort of seamless. The themes yeah. in this book are really seamless with my life. But there is a chapter in the book where I interviewed my father about being a traveling salesman, which I've never done before, and I'd always wanted to ask him about it. And because he, because I really feel like being a traveling salesman is a skill, is, is sort of like what being a, a touring writer is too. Like yeah. you're sort of going out there, you've got your little wares on your arm. Selling, you're selling. You've got to sell, hey. hey. Yeah. Can, you, can I interest you in a junior? Right, can I, <laughs> <laughs> can I interest you in a 272 page memoir? <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it was fascinating to me because, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and my mom, my parents owned a sewing store, and then my dad was a, a traveling salesman also. And um, they, you know, I grew up like the child of a small business owner. Like, I, I, there's no, I understand my connection with bookstores and working in bookstores and wanting to hang out in bookstores and things like that. I understand the appeal of like what a small business can do for the community. Um, and I understand, like, when I interviewed my dad, I was like, I. I understand how hard it was now for you. I understand what the challenges were, but he just was a pure salesman through, through he's still alive. He was, he, he, but he's not a salesman anymore. Um, he was a pure salesman through and through, and he just really, um, he felt like he, he, he really could sell anything. So, and, and he always, there's a line in the book that's about having product knowledge. Like, you know, and he was like, whenever you do a reading, you, People always ask you about your process or why you wrote your book, and he's like, "You have, you know, like the implication being that I have product knowledge <laughs> <laughs> because I know my book. Do you yeah. have that product knowledge? Yeah. I know I have to give you over to the audience. Um, I always have way more questions. Can I ask one more? Yeah, thank you. Um, this is just like purely for pleasure in me, but um, I have to ask you about like the idea of hauntings and like being haunted in this book because there there is like a in this book like a very specific like interaction like a spectral kind of interaction with a with a with ghost. ghost you know and there's actually, like bones and all kinds of things in here like the dead yeah. and things like that we were talking about how in the reviews they didn't talk they didn't talk yeah. about how i saw a ghost and i was like they didn't want to touch it they didn't want to go anywhere my near my ghost nest <laughs> wimps <laughs> i'm going to just tell really quickly that i did see a ghost once and um, and I bet you some of you have ghost stories too. 
and um, I'm not the only one, right? And um, I saw a ghost once, and um, in a hotel room in New Hampshire. I'm not going to tell the whole story because we're like low well on time. But yeah, and you can also read it in this book. And it's in the book. Like yeah, but I, but once I saw a ghost, I was like, I, it was sort of like I, I was a different, slightly different person. And I, it was sort of the most terrifying thing that had happened to me, but also it was the, one of the most interesting things that had ever happened to me. Yeah. And I became really occupied with going to places that were kind of haunted or about, you know, like ossuaries and cemeteries, other kind of otherworldly locations. Yeah. And it became really fascinating to me, um, and still is fascinating to me. And I, I'm like looking around here, and like, there might be a couple ghosts in here. <laughs> um, and it was. I don't know, it's just, it's just like a, once you sort of start to understand that everywhere, like everywhere you are is buried on some, somebody else, yeah. in a way, yeah. um, then uh, the world sort of starts to look a little bit different, yeah. and even if it is, can be sad or bittersweet or scary or anything like that, it's like important for us to understand that we weren't there first. Well, that's a great little note to leave on. I'm going to yeah, I'll give, give, give it up and give it up. So you guys can ask me anything yes. <laughs> over the next 15 minutes. All right, if you want to ask a question, um, feel free to just line up with this microphone right here. Um, or Kristen will keep asking me questions. Oh, okay. Also, don't touch me. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for Craft Talk and how generous you are with your knowledge and experience. I love it. I just, I'm so inspired by it all the time. So thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. It's uh, helpful too. I really love it. Um, do you have uh, an essay in here that's a favorite or that was particularly interesting or fun to write? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I will tell you that there's one chapter that's called A Trip to the End of the World, which was the first, which was a chapter that I worked on for like four years. It's not like a happy chapter, but it was like a really important chapter to me, and when I find, and I just kept trying to nail it, and once I did finally nail it, I, I realized there was no way I was ever gonna be able to like sell it anywhere, like it didn't fit into any box. And I, it was part of what, one of the reasons why I actually wrote the book, because I wanted it to exist in the world. Uh, so, I mean, I kind of wrote a book around it, <laughs> um, in a way. Um, and then, I, you know, I really like the chapter that you're in, Kristen. There's a whole chapter that's about Kristen and our friendship and sort of making, and making friends with people online. And it comes near the end of the book, and it's really, it's just really sweet. And it's like, you know, written about a time in my life where I'm like arriving in a more settled and happier place and joyful kind of place. So I like those. I like it all for different reasons, but those are the two that stand out. I mean, if you weren't here, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's totally fair. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I have a question. Um, so how did you spend so much time with yourself, looking at yourself and staying nice to yourself? Because I mean, I know that you have been cranky, but you are so um, relentlessly compassionate about yourself and all the way up until the end, and it's like the most reassuring thing ever, so how? <laughs> um, I mean, it was weird because I thought I would, I think I wrote this somewhere, like, that I was like, thought it was gonna be hard to face myself, and then it was, and then it turned out it was the pandemic and I like couldn't escape myself. So it just like totally, like I was like really forced to do it. So I think it was like, I couldn't, I had a, I really just had to decide what I wanted to be, the book to be about, right? Like did I, so I, I think I wrote, there is a version of it, especially with the extra 22,000 words version of it, where I am probably a lot harsher on myself. Like, there, that is the warts and all draft, and only a couple people have read that draft. And then I think there was, at some point, like, decisions were made where we were cutting out darker stuff, is that right, Helen? Like, we're sort of like, there were, like, that was, and I was sort of in a, maybe got into a happier place in my life that I was ready to do it, but it was like, I did, I would say the first draft of it was like a way darker draft, but I, I think it's because I wrote that version first and I just had to get it out of my system. But how in general am I nicer to myself? I don't know, I live in New Orleans. I'm happy there. I'm happier. I don't know what to say about it. I just like go, for, I, I live in the sunshine. That's how I feel. <laughs> so cheesy, but like, it's just nice, it's just like the weather does something for me, or I don't, I don't, but I'm happy here right now at this moment. 
it, so it's not killing me, but I, it just became important to me to be happier. Like, I, I definitely made a choice that I didn't, I didn't want to, like, I was working so hard for so long, and I was like, for what? Like, where am I going to get to with this? And then, I, you know, I was in mid 40s when I moved down there, but I was like, what if I just, because that was the deal with New Orleans, right? It was my happy place. And I was like, that's where I go when I want to be happy. But then the rest of the time, I'm just going to work and be miserable. And then at some point, I was like, what if I just lived where I was happy all the time? And, you know, now I'm not happy all the time there, but I'm still pretty happy there. It's, you know, what do we want? What? And the dog. The dog is good. <laughs> oh, cutie. I made my, I made my dog send me a picture of him today. I'm so I can't remember what he looked like. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? I came all this way. <laughs> Mary's like, I'll ask any other question now. Anybody else? Oh. Conversations that writers have to have with the people in their life, mm -hmm. life to include personal details about other people, what is um, okay to include, what isn't. And I'd love to know what your process was in terms of is asking permission a thing? I'm not a writer, but I love reading memoirs and I haven't read your book yet. So would love to know a bit what that process was like for you with um, knowing what information to include from other people. This is a very good question, and also I like your scarf. Um, I, so first I wrote the version where I didn't ask anyone for any permission. And, which I, I think Alex G was like, just do what you want first and don't talk to anyone about it and get it out there and see, and see what you want to keep. I thought a lot about what my intention was behind the book, like what I, you know, was it like an angry book? Was it like a loving book? Was it like a, just, a, you know, existential book, that kind of thing. Um, I then cut some stuff that I, like I was like, if I wouldn't want to ask the person this question, if I could use it, then I'm not going to use it. And then some stuff I changed, if I still wanted to use it, I changed a lot of details. So like I have a, a, more than a few characters that are like maybe compressed, or uh, compos for composite characters. There's, you know, like one or two or three people are like, you know, sort of in it, in one character at once. I definitely changed names, I changed hair colors. Um, I had to get permission from my parents. Um, I, you know, talked, interviewed both of them. I've been writing about my mom for years. I, so the first chapter of the book is about her is actually three chapters combined. Um, and, or three separate essays combined. There's a lot of stuff in the book that um, is, um, repurposed material that I sort of, like there's one chapter in the book that's like five essays, and I just would take like one paragraph from here, two paragraphs from there, so it's like a, this is not a beautiful, beautiful Frankenstein. It's a really like a, you know, it's, it, has a, it has a collage effect that you don't actually know you're experiencing, but it's there, trust me. Um, and uh, my parents did ask for some changes, some other people in my life asked for some changes to it. So it was really like a, I tried to be as responsible as I could to people. I think that people too sometimes are afraid of writing about people in their life, but I think if you, you have to secure permission. I did get a legal review. Um, I was told by the lawyer that the only two people who might be, you know, I might have had to talk to are dead. So, like, I kind of, like, those are, and even them, I, I changed a lot of the details that were in the book, like, identifying details about them. I was not like a, this wasn't a hit job. <laughs> it was, um, but I do talk about some difficult stuff in the book. I was really, I was really conscientious, I think I was pretty conscientious about it. We'll see. <laughs> So Jamie and Kristen for being here, and then all of you for again bringing the cold and being here tonight. Thank you all. Um, 
so now what we're going to do is we're going to do a personalization line. All of your books are, are already signed, um, so uh, but if you want to get your books personalized, um, you can just line up along the center aisle, and I'll do a little post-it with your name, and then Jamie can write your name in your book. Um, but yeah, um, that, that's about it for everything. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.